mostly think about emotions as internal states that are important for driving survival behaviors. They're evolutionarily ancient, and when they kick in, they push everything else aside. You see something threatening, you need to encode that information in sensory areas. You need to be able to drive the motor components of actions to be able to, say, escape something that was really threatening. But that's not how most people think about emotions. They think about emotions as feelings. I feel sad. I feel angry. I feel happy. The question of how do emotions work as a science really was kind of contemporaneously in both disciplines, psychology and neuroscience. For most of that history, people looked for particular parts of the brain. What do they do? What are they important for? Are there centers for fear? Are there centers for disgust, for other emotions? And eventually, the realization that, yes, emotions are in the brain, but it's much more complicated than trying to assign them to particular structures. You know, each nucleus, each area of the brain is not, you know, working in a vacuum. It's not sitting in a dish, rather, it's communicating with many other areas of the brain. So when we talk about emotions, we really need to look at this whole brain view, and we don't really have a good understanding of how the brain as a whole is functioning in emotions. We should be thinking of it more like an orchestra, not you know a solo act. I like to think of emotions as a giant iceberg and the feeling part of emotion is just the tip of the iceberg that you can see above the surface of the water, which is consciousness. And the part that's below the water is the non-conscious aspect of emotion. And nowadays we have tools available that of course we didn't have available even 10, 20 years ago. Um, functional MRI like we have here at Caltech, and the ability to record from electrodes the activity of single brain cells. So all of those uh, you know, gave rise to a kind of change in thinking from particular places in the brain, like the amygdala, the insula, prefrontal cortex, that indeed are important for emotion, to thinking more broadly about systems and about populations of neurons and how they work. I think there's this new push in, in neuroscience for large-scale recordings to be able to track the activity of neurons during an emotion state, you know, across many regions of the brain to understand kind of the holistic picture of how the brain is responding during emotions. So just like the visual cortex at the back of your brain is responsible for taking vision in and mapping and processing that, auditory cortex for taking in auditory stimuli and for instance making it possible that you can understand everything I'm saying right now. Insular cortex gets all the input from your body. So pain, nausea, if you stimulate in a human electrically in a surgical setting, the insula, you will elicit amongst other things feelings, pain, and reports of emotional feelings. In our lab, we focus on the hypothalamus. Um, this is a region in the brain that's below the cortex that we usually think of as um, conscious perception. Uh, so it's a subcortical region that its role is promoting internal emotion states. So it integrates information like sensory information, context, in order to generate emotion state. One thing that's really notable about anxiety is that most people who are experiencing anxiety, consciously they know there is no threat, right? And they say, I know that my response is exaggerated, but I can't control it. You know, we're always thinking that we are the ones that are in control, but really a lot of times our emotions are in control of us. And this kind of changes my perspective in my science because, you know, it kind of brings this new light that these subcortical deep structures in the brain that, you know, are in every single animal that are important for survival, that your conscious perception might not have as much access to, might be the structures that are important for generating these emotion states. Mental illnesses that affect emotions are often associated with changes in the length of an emotion or the strength of an emotion. It can be too strong or too weak, or it can last too long or not last long enough. And that's why we feel like studying these sort of basic building blocks, these emotion primitives that control things like the strength and the length of an internal state may lead us to mechanisms that might be useful down the road for treating mental illnesses.